Hello, everyone. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Flatwoods Church. It is good to be gathered together, both here in this space and for those of you worshiping with us online today. My two sons have piano lessons every Saturday afternoon. We finally got into a consistent rhythm last fall after lots of stopping and starting with COVID and our move to Kansas City and all of that. And they love their teacher. They love going to her house, playing on her grand piano, chasing her cats while the other brother is in his lesson. They love playing in recitals, and they love showing off their songs to their friends. But do you know what they do not love? <laughs> they do not love to practice. Every single day, it is a battle to wrangle even 10 minutes of attentive time at the keys, <laughs> repeating scales and exercises, working on tricky spots in their songs. I get it. I hated practicing piano when I was a kid, too. It's hard to feel or notice the payoff in the moment. It feels futile, like nothing is happening. My oldest son, Ezekiel, who I just told him before he went to Kid Connection that I was telling the story, he was like, but he put it well this week as I demanded that he glue his backside to the piano bench and finish his assignment. But mom, I'm not learning anything new. This is a child for whom many things come easy. He's a quick learner, he's curious and smart, he likes new things, and once he's got it, he's got it. He's ready for the next thing, or so he thinks. I finally caved in the argument. Fine, don't practice. Good luck at your lesson. He seemed unconcerned. <laughs> Last Saturday, after his lesson, Ms. Michelle had some feedback for him. Ezekiel, we'll need to do the last two pages of Unit 9 again, and you need to say the note names out loud as you play. You don't know them as well as you think you do, and it will be hard to move forward if the, those notes are not second nature to you. We don't practice to always learn something new. We practice to take on a second nature. We practice to ingrain the notes into our heads and our hearts and our hands so that one day when we sit down, like Walter does, <laughs> the music just pours out onto the keyboard because it has become a part of us. Today we are wrapping up our sermon series, Becoming who do we want to be? We want to take on a clear identity as a church that is inviting all people into full life together in Jesus Christ. And we want people to experience that full life together in a faith community where everyone can belong, be curious, and be courageous. But we don't just become that way overnight. It's not just a new skill that we can quickly acquire and then move on. What do we have to do? We practice. Just like piano or sports or other skills, we practice spiritual rhythms, not to change us suddenly, but to become the people, the church we want to be. So we've explored our defining practices here at Platwoods Church, gather, grow, give, and go and each of these categories offers to us tried and true spiritual disciplines that have shaped millions of faithful people before us. These are nothing new, but we are once again laying claim to them, trusting that though these practices don't change over time, as we engage them, we do. We change. We become. And the practices shape that full life together that Jesus desires for us. So just as a quick recap... We gather for worship and sacraments. We grow in prayer and scripture. We give of our time, Sabbath, and money, tithe. And today, we will talk about how we go in acts of mercy and justice and pilgrimage. And those first three messages are all online. If you're just starting out with us here at Platte Woods, or if you've missed the last few weeks, you can always go back and catch up on our website. But we're wrapping up the series today with that final G, Go. Most of our practices that we've talked about so far sort of draw us inward. They bring us together as a community. We need each other to deepen our experience of gathering and growing. 
And even giving is somewhat interior as we practice it. But go is obviously a different kind of action verb. These are the practices that send us out. Go is where our full life, our faith, begins to matter to others. What happens inside of us has an outward manifestation. We go by practicing acts of mercy and justice, and we go by practicing pilgrimage. So acts of mercy and justice, that might sound like we're trying to squeeze two practices into one. Um, They are distinct, but they are also inseparable. So yeah, we might be cheating a little bit, but really it's a two for one kind of thing. Micah 6.8 a prophet in the Old Testament. Micah 6.8 is a verse that's recognizable to many, perhaps. It's sort of a mission statement in and of itself for our ultimate purpose as humans. So when in doubt about what it is you should be doing with your life, just go to Micah 6.8. It's a, it's a great anchor for all of us. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Act justly. The Hebrew word here is mishpat. To love mercy. Other versions say love kindness or show mercy, and the Hebrew word here is chesed. Mishpat is the root word for justice or judgment, and it carries within it the presupposition that there is a plan for the world, God's order of rightness, things as they should be, particularly with regard to the disadvantaged. So seeking out justice, acting justly in the biblical sense, is pursuing that right order of the world according to God's mind, not Ours, not our understanding of justice, but God's. Hesed is a little trickier to translate, but the best English attempt, which has grown in its use, is loving kindness. All one word, smash it together. Loving kindness. And it holds that notion of goodness, kindness, love, and compassion all at once. So loving kindness works, catches it all. So mishpat and chesed, justice and loving kindness, or mercy, are a matched set. Throughout scripture, they consistently appear together. It is hard to have one without the other, and yet they are distinct. Perhaps a simplified way to look at the two is to think about the micro and the macro views, the small picture and the big picture. Chesed, mercy, loving kindness, that's the micro level. This is where we meet one another, one-on-one, in moments of compassion and care and mercy. We see another human being in need and we respond. We enter into sympathy with a neighbor's suffering and we react. Our hearts are moved by the plight of a person trying to make ends meet and so we pay their utility bill. We give $20 to the veteran experiencing homelessness at 64th and I-29 because we see them as a human being someone battling demons we might recognize in ourselves. We send money to assist with earthquake relief in Syria and Turkey. We stock a refugee family's refrigerator so when they arrive in a new country, they at least will not be hungry. We walk alongside a young adult in recovery, helping them gain stability and establish permanent housing. Acts of mercy loving kindness, are are most of what we do together in our church mission partnerships here at Platwoods. We respond to Jesus' exhortation in Matthew 25 when he describes what the last judgment will really look like. He says it this way, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then those who are righteous, who are seeking to live rightly, will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it for me. 
These human-to-human -human acts of love and kindness and compassion take us outside of ourselves to see need and pain and suffering around us at the micro level, one-on-one. -on -one. We live in the small picture. But acts of justice, mishpat, are when the small picture starts to point us to a bigger one. We realize after seeing so many of the small pieces of the puzzle that something is not as it should be in the world. The first words that Jesus utters publicly, out loud, in the Gospel of Luke are words that speak to this big picture of justice. He comes into the synagogue and he stands to read from the Old Testament, from the scroll of Isaiah, and these are the words that come forth. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he goes on to say that in his coming, in his arrival in this moment, those words are now fulfilled, that he has come to bring about justice, to set things right in the world again the way they are supposed to be. The poor will have hope. The imprisoned will be set free. Those who cannot see will see, and those who are oppressed will be liberated. These visions require bigger actions than handing out food or clothing, caring for the sick, or welcoming a stranger. Jesus' proclamation of justice speaks to the overhaul and the correction of systems that have ordered the world in unjust ways. One of the best examples of, that I've seen recently of how these acts of mercy and acts of justice converge happened just last weekend right here in this space. Platwoods hosted a cost of poverty experience in conjunction with our ministry partner, Care Portal. And some of you might have participated right here in this room or maybe done something similar in the past. But everyone who participates arrives and then is grouped into a family. So I ended up in a family of three with my actual son, Ezekiel, along with Stan Shipman. Stan, you're in the room. I saw you earlier. You're somewhere here. I can't see you. <laughs> I know Stan is here. <laughs> Within that family then, that um, improvised family, each person takes on a new identity. So I was Mickey, I was a 50-something woman with a master's degree, but also with crippling bipolar disorder and a lot of student debt. And I was caught in this cycle of my mental health preventing me from steady employment. Therefore, I couldn't afford the meds that I needed to regain stability. Ezekiel, my 11-year-old son, played the part of my sister who worked a minimum wage job as a bartender. <laughs> He was really great at his job. I got good reports. He was very consistent, showed up for work all the time, on time. But he was the one that carried the bulk of the responsibility for everyone, the only one who could provide income for the family. And Stan, then, was Laura's son, a 22-year-old community college student, also trying to help his family out. So in this experience, every family unit is different and has different stories. But every 15 minutes equals one week. So you start out with a certain amount of cash or debt, and you may or may not have a car, but by the end of the hour, you have lived a month. You have to pay rent, you have to pay utilities, you have to buy groceries, you have to go to school, you have to get your meds. Some people have bank accounts, some people can't get one. Basically, you navigate a month living on resources below the poverty line, which is $35,000 a year. Some of you in this room have lived that life, or you're living it now, or close to it. It's not a simulation for you. 6% of the population in Platte County, which is the second wealthiest county in Missouri, 6% is below the poverty line. And please know that if that is you, if you are living there on the edge, as your church, we are here for you. Reach out to a pastor, a staff member for help to gain stability and relief. Living in poverty is exhausting. You don't have to do it alone. The simulation, then, finds many families out of resources by the second week, 30 minutes in. They don't have reliable transportation, so they lose their jobs. They get evicted. Some ended up in jail. And by the end of our hour-long simulation, there were, t I think there were 10, 11 people out of the 70 participants who were in the homeless shelter, which was right there in the back row. So this whole experience 
opens your heart and your mind to the real world for so many in our community. I felt physically in my body the anxiety of trying to figure out how to make ends meet in this hour of my time, the helplessness of not being able to get the medication that I needed to function, the fear of whether my sister was going to be able to support us. It awakens within you the empathy, the compassion that is needed for our acts of mercy in the world. But the more powerful part unfolded during the Q&A afterwards. Everyone began to reflect on their own individual experience, their own frustrations, their own feelings of helplessness, and then they began to ask the bigger picture questions. Why? Why can't I find housing that isn't 60% of my paycheck? Why does it take so much time to get around the city if I don't have a car? Why doesn't Medicaid cover this prescription? Why are kids stealing and selling stuff at pawn shops? Why do kids miss school to go to work instead? Why aren't there more resources for early childhood education? Why are there more people of color living in poverty than white people? The why questions are the justice questions. The why questions take our close-up experience of something that doesn't seem right in our world and zoom out to the communal level. What is the bigger thing that is broken that is causing so many people to suffer in this way? And what can we do to change it? Our acts of justice and mercy shape us, form us to become compassionate people, to become a compassionate church. And in our compassion, we become curious about why things are the way they are and how our human life together could be better. We also become courageous to stand up to really big forces and systems in the world that cause harm and to advocate for a different way. But they also help us to overcome fear at a very basic level. Fear of discomfort, fear of the other, fear of someone who is different from us. I have a good friend from my last church who for the longest time was simply afraid to volunteer with any of our church's outreach opportunities. She knew, she knew in her mind that that was silly, but she, she didn't know what might happen. She didn't know what she would have in common with the people she would meet. She was unfamiliar with the neighborhood she'd be going to. She was terrified of her own discomfort. That fear is so real for so many comfortable people. But finally, she just did it. The spirit compelled her, and she did it. She signed up. She became a reading buddy at our underserved partner school, and a whole new world opened up to her. Where the world tells us to be afraid of people who are not like us, and where the world dehumanizes people living in poverty or under oppression, practicing mercy and justice opens our eyes to see the other and to find not only God's reflection there, but also our own. The final practice that we're exploring in this series is the practice of pilgrimage. That might sound like a strange word in a modern Methodist church, but pilgrimage is a way of going in our faith that has long been overlooked in many Protestant traditions. And I think we can reclaim both our understanding and our practice of pilgrimage together as a church. Anyone ever been on a pilgrimage? A few of you? Yeah. Often we, we think first of a trip to the Holy Land, right? Like that is the pilgrimage of all pilgrimages. I say that word a lot. Hope I don't trip over it. I've never been to the Holy Land. Both of our other pastors, Pastor Matt and Pastor Jess, both, or no, Matt hasn't. Pastor Chung Ho and Pastor Jess have been to the Holy Land. But I'm sure for those of you who have been, it's, it's a sacred journey. And that is at the heart of what any pilgrimage is. It's a sacred journey, a spiritual way of going in which you have some expectation of encounter. Encounter with the divine Encounter with strangers, encounter with your own soul. The origin of this act of pilgrimage is unknown. I would suggest that people have practiced pilgrimage in some form as long as humans have walked the earth. We are designed as sojourners. Our life is journey. 
And so we are from birth searching for the sacred and the holy, the something bigger than us in the world around us. But the specific tradition of Christian pilgrimage is, of course, rooted first in the Jewish people's journeys to Jerusalem for their sacred feasts. We see that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. We even hear about Jesus as a pilgrim in the story uh, where his parents leave him behind in the temple when he's a boy. It's like the only story we have from his childhood. They had journeyed three days home already before they realized he was missing. In early Christianity, then, this practice quickly grows as people across the newly Christian empire want to go back and visit and retrace the steps of where Jesus walked. And so over the next many centuries, there are three major Christian pilgrimages that gain popularity across Europe. There's pilgrimage to Jerusalem, of course, the climax of the Jesus story. There's a pilgrimage to Rome, the heart of the Christian empire and also the burial place of St. Peter. And then there's pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, which is in present-day Spain. That might be a little bit lesser known. But this is where the remains of the Apostle James are believed to be enshrined. Travelers along these pilgrim routes would walk and walk for hundreds of miles over many weeks to experience something sacred, something mysterious, something challenging, to encounter the presence of God in ways they could not predict. They longed to feel a spiritual experience in a very embodied, very physical way as their feet pushed on and their bodies grew weary and lean. And while all three of those pilgrimages sound amazing and we should do all of them together as a church, the reality is that most Christians won't ever be able to take such grand trips. There's much more to the practice of pilgrimage than grandiose travels. The story that I think of first when I think of what a pilgrimage practice looks like in everyday life comes from Luke 24. This is the day that Jesus awakens in the darkness of a tomb, gets up, leaves his burial clothes behind, walks out in the path of the stone rolling away, and back out into the sunlight of day. He has appeared to Mary Magdalene, but so far nobody else really has any idea what is happening. Seven miles away... However, on a road to a town called Emmaus, two disciples are walking, and they are rehashing and going over everything that has just happened in prior days. It's a mess. Everything is a mess. But they are making this journey all the same. And suddenly, Jesus appears beside them and starts walking with them. They don't recognize him, but they fill him in, bring him into the conversation, tell him all the scuttlebutt that's going on. It's all about him, of course. And he dives into the conversation too, reinterpreting scripture for them and teaching them to see things they didn't understand before. And finally, they arrived at their destination. When they came to Emmaus, he, Jesus, acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? This is the story that inspires me to go on pilgrimage. This was an ordinary walk that turned into something extraordinary because Jesus was there. They didn't know it, but he was. And they knew something was up because their hearts were on fire. It was a spiritual journey where they encountered the divine. That could happen to us any day of the week. On any excursion where we decide to become a pilgrim. What if your morning walk became a spiritual journey instead? A time in which you looked intentionally at the world and people around you, a time when you expected the presence of Jesus to walk alongside you, a time that showed you something new about the world. What if the distance between the school parking lot to your first class of the day became a spiritual adventure on which you believed God had something to show you? 
What if our kids going off to camp this summer go with an anticipation of their hearts being on fire as they walk together? What if we reframed the old idea of a mission trip where we tend to overfocus on our capacity to help and bring solutions? What if we shaped that into a practice of pilgrimage where we go to other people with an expectation of nothing more then we will encounter God with them because God is already there. Yes, some pilgrimages are special. They are planned and set apart. Those are important. We need to do them together, and we will. But some pilgrimages can happen in the backyard or a park or around the outer perimeter of the church or through the historical streets of a racially divided city or to the southern border of the United States, or to Pine Ridge Reservation, or to the grocery store to buy food for a neighbor in need. Because you see, it will happen sometimes when we go that the practices of pilgrimage and mercy and justice will converge. That is a risk we take when we walk with Jesus. As we draw this series to a close, I encourage you to go. Step into acts of mercy and justice. Talk with our staff, our ministry leaders about how you can take a first step or a next step in the ways that we act with compassion in our community, the ways we show loving kindness to those who are struggling and suffering. I know that Brandy has a whole station set up out here today, showcasing and highlighting some of the ways you can step out and go. Or come visit or join our new justice ministry group. You can talk to Pastor Chung Ho for more information about that, but come be a part of this group at Platte Woods Church that is seeking to address larger systemic issues in our community that keep people bound or alienated. And go on a pilgrimage in your own neighborhood, around our city, Join us on a journey to El Paso and Ciudad Juarez or to Pine Ridge Reservation. There's an information meeting coming up about that next Sunday. Or the student summer trips or children's camp. Expect the holy to happen on the journeys that are ahead of you, the ones that you walk in solitude and the ones that we walk together. Our practices shape us. They form our becoming. They become second nature in our spirit. And at Platwoods Church, we will practice over and over worship and sacraments, prayer and scripture, tithe and Sabbath, acts of mercy and justice, and pilgrimage, because we believe they will shape us into a curious, courageous, and loving people who will become a church where we live in full life together, the life that Jesus longs for us to live the life he invites all people to live. Will you pray with me? God, you are the love that goes before us, who goes with us, who prods us along when we are too complacent or afraid to move. Meet us in our journey right where we are, and strengthen our spirits. Build in us the capacity to meet others where they are, to love them, to invite them, to welcome them, just as we have been welcomed into your love. Make us a church that feels like home to every person, those here and those we have yet to invite. In the name of Jesus, who walks with us. Amen.